Very kind, I'm very nervous. <laughs> um, good morning, church family and friends, also those joining online. We're glad that you've joined us here at Grace on Main. If you're a guest today or a visitor, please, um, we extend a warm welcome to you also. We would like you to fill out the yellow visitor's card that's located in the pew rack. We hope you will fill it out and place it in the offering plate as it's passed later in the service. It will help us to get to know you a little better. Here at Grace on Main, Sunday school studies are available for all ages. We also have children's church for the kids. Please um, note that the bulletin and overhead screen will cue the kids when to leave for children's church. In the bulletin, you will find detailed information relating to the weekly calendar, upcoming events, scheduled meetings, opportunities to serve, and prayer requests. We also have a minute for mission today provided, presented by Holly Smith. Good morning, Grace. Good morning. As you all know, we just wrapped up a great week of Vacation Bible School, and it was a blast. We helped over 50 kids to unearth the truth about Jesus through Bible stories, crafts, singing songs, and so much more. Here are a few comments from the families who participated. I loved the music and the messages therein. We woke up singing, dig a hole, celebrated throughout the day with You Will Find Me, and prayed gratefulness with the lullaby of Jesus is born. Another one. He is singing Christian songs. He asked to say grace before dinner. They enjoyed it all, crafts, music, and snacks. The staff were so gracious to my daughter who was too shy to join a group where she did not know anyone. They allowed her to join in with her big sister. My kids were very excited to go each day, and the first time we put the VBS music in, they were hooked. Thank you for a wonderful VBS 2021. Grace, you were asked months ago when the planning process began to help make this year's VBS epic. Well, we did it. Everyone who helped with VBS in one way or another, could you please stand? Yes, come on, let's do it. Everyone who helped out, thank you. Yes. Thank you. So I want to take a minute to recognize Ms. Holly Smith, our wonderful director of children's ministries. She has spent countless hours organizing, preparing, and orchestrating this year's VBS program. Destination Dig was a huge success, and many children learned to seek truth and find Jesus. And um, all thanks to the efforts of Holly and our wonderful volunteers here. So. Holly, thank you for your selfless service and dedication to our children and their families. I pray that the seeds you and your teachers have sown in the hearts of our little ones will produce good fruit um, and that you need to know that God is so pleased with you and we are blessed to have you. And we'd like to present these gifts to you as a token of our gratitude and appreciation for your hard work working with our little ones. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Don't lose this first up a nice gift in there. <laughs> Thank you.
please join me in our call to worship. Come near to the Lord and he will come near to you as we begin our worship celebration in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please join me in declaring the call to worship responsibly as found in your bulletin and on the screen. Come, listen to the word of the Lord. Help us to receive God's word and direction for our lives. Proclaim the goodness of God's love. Let our voices and our actions be filled with love. Come, now is the time to worship. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are gathered here today to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to sing your praises out of sincere hearts, motivated by our love and gratitude for all you are and for all you've done. Holy Spirit, awaken in us an understanding of God's beauty and splendor and power. Stir in us the desire to celebrate, rejoice, and give thanks. Open our eyes to see and savor all that God is for us in Christ Jesus. Orchestrate our service and lead us in corporate praise of our triune God. Protect us from heresy and help us to worship in the light of what's true. We desire to worship you with our hearts and our affections, with the totality of our beings. I pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Please stand if you're able for our opening hymn.
of God, we hear the gospel message that Jesus was questioned and rejected by his own hometown, friends, and relatives. We wonder how he was able to continue in ministry with such a lack of support. We want, want to, to enter our endeavors with full support and acclamation. We are afraid, afraid to begin a task if even our families, friends, and hometown folk belittle our work and us. Rather than face opposition, we back down. Forgive our lack of faith and vision. Empower us to be in service to you even when we do not feel the support of our family and friends. Let us trust in your power and presence with us. Heal us, guide our lives and our journeys all our days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The psalmist writes, For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Vacation Bible School was. What was our model? Seek truth and find Jesus. Absolutely. Seek truth and find Jesus. And now we're going to tell you, you will find him. You will find me. Ready?
Awesome job. As we prepare to read the scriptures this morning, let us prepare our hearts and minds in prayer. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that in the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed. We may be led into your truth and taught your will. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. The New Testament lesson today is Mark chapter 6 verses 1 through 6 found in your pew Bible on page 817. Jesus has just left a woman so filled with faith that she was healed simply by touching his cloak. Now the people who should know him best have so little faith he can do little to help them. Christ's intent for using miracles is to perform them as a response to faith. When there is no faith, miracles would contradict his purpose. On the heels of this rejection, Jesus commissions the 12 to begin their own ministries in his name. He sends them off with the command to rely on those they teach for support and gives them authority to heal, exercise demons, and even raise the dead. He left that place and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power were being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Hoseas and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and, above, and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching the gospel of our Lord. Take a look at the people around you. Go ahead, take a, take a good look at the people around you. You were all once that cute. <laughs> and so was I. What happened? <laughs> 
That's really sad. Age must wear on us terribly. Please join me in prayer. (coughs) Gracious God, our default setting is often I can't. Help us to remember and to know that with you all things are possible. And that you can transform our I can't into God can. God will. God does. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. A Marine stationed in Afghanistan received a Dear John letter from his girlfriend back home. It read as follows. Dear Ricky, I cannot continue any longer in our relationship. The distance between us is just too great. I must admit that I have cheated on you three times since you've been gone. And it's not fair to either of us. I'm sorry. Please return the picture of me that I sent to you. Love, Becky. Understandably, the Marine had very hurt feelings. He asked his fellow Marines for any snapshots that they could spare of their girlfriends, their sisters, their ex-girlfriends, their aunts, their cousins, etc. And in addition to the picture of Becky, Ricky included all the other pictures of the pretty girls he had collected from his buddies. There were 27 photos in that envelope, along with this note. Dear Becky, I'm so sorry, but I can't quite remember who you are. (laughs) Please take your picture from the pile and send the rest back to me. Take care. Ricky, we all hate rejection. Innate within us is a desire for community, for acceptance, for welcome. Our experience tells us that not everyone will accept us. Not everyone welcomes us. We cannot belong to every group because not every group wants us or desires our company. And the reverse is also true. One of my favorite Groucho Marx quotes is this one. I would never want to belong to any group that would have someone like me as a member. (laughs) We don't like rejection unless we're the ones doing the rejecting. Rejection hurts. And it hurts most when it comes from those we know best. Rejection by family or friends or loved ones bears a more poignant sting. Why? Well, if anyone should love or accept us, it is those who are most like us and those who know us best. The great American poet Robert Frost defined home in this way. Home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Oh, if this were only always true. Family and friends should take us in. Unfortunately, sometimes these are the very people who turn us away. The Gospel of John records the following words about Jesus in the first chapter, the prologue to John. He, Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world didn't even notice him. He came to his own people, but they didn't want him. 
His own people didn't want him. Think about that for a moment. His own people did not want Jesus. They rejected him. The prophet Isaiah described the coming of Messiah as one despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with suffering. For centuries, the Jewish people prayed for, anticipated, and looked for the arrival of the Messiah. Each Jewish mother, when pregnant, would pray that she might be the one to bear the Messiah. And surely when Messiah finally came, the people would recognize him and welcome him. But you know the rest of the story. Jesus left home to begin his ministry at the age of 30 in and around the city of Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee and compared to Nazareth, a big city. It wasn't very far away, just 20 miles from Nazareth, yet culturally, politically, and in terms of sophistication, it was worlds away. So Jesus comes back home. He already has a reputation by the time he comes home to Nazareth. He is known as a miracle worker, healing withered limbs, casting out demons, raising the dead, healing lepers and calming the stormy sea. He's gained notoriety as a great teacher, using homey parables to communicate God's truth. He stands up to the religious authorities. He sides with the needs of the common people. And people identify with Jesus. He's quickly gaining a following. Jesus is becoming quite famous. And then he comes home. Back home to Nazareth. A famous person returning to his hometown today would almost expect a ticker tape parade. A hero's welcome and the presentation of the key to the city. Journalists would gather. News crews and cameramen would capture the moment. Jesus doesn't get any kind of welcome. And he goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath, which was his custom. And he sat and taught them the scriptures. And the reaction of the crowd was not welcome, but astonishment. Where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters also with us? It's very likely that Jesus' message was not at all changed or moderated for his hometown crowd. He probably preached the same sermon in Nazareth that he had been preaching everywhere else. And you know it. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Ooh. Repent. Change? Us? Who? Me? Who does Jesus think he is? We know him. He's one of us. And we know his family. We know his roots. Isn't this the kid who worked in the carpenter shop? How dare he think he can teach us? And how dare he call us? to change. The scriptures say that the people took offense at Jesus, not at what he said, not at what he did, but at him. He offended them. In the year 2000, I was invited back to my home congregation, Third United Presbyterian Church in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, to preach their 100th anniversary celebration. Sorry to say the church no longer exists. They had to fold. When I was a youngster in Sunday school, the church was 1,200 members, had the largest Sunday school in the United Presbyterian Church. 
And I still can't figure out how driving three hours, because I lived in Fremont, Ohio at the time, how driving three hours can drop 30 some years from your age. But there I was in my home church and all of a sudden I was 10 years old again. All the little old ladies who were my Sunday school teachers patted me on the head and pinched my cheek and related stories of my growing up. They all remembered me when and one of the men of the church spoke to me at the fellowship dinner after the service was held and he said, gee, it would be great if you would come back and be our pastor. And I laughed and responded, not on your life. <laughs> <coughs> Remember Jesus' words, prophets are without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. If I accepted a call to my home church, I could only have credibility with the people who couldn't remember me when I was a kid because everyone else would remember me when. Jesus had credibility with everyone else, but not those who knew him best. Jesus could perform mighty works in Capernaum and around the countryside, but not in his hometown. And he marveled at their unbelief. Frankly, I would have been ticked off. I would have been angry. Luann had me calm down last night. We were driving back from Virginia Beach and I stopped at McDonald's to get a cup of coffee. After waiting 10 minutes to place my order because there were cars in front of me and I understand that. We pulled up to the microphone and I ordered a cup of coffee with creamer and Splenda. And when I got to the pay window, I paid, and the man said, pull up to the third window. We'll bring it to you. After 10 minutes, I was getting a little hot under the collar. After 15, I was getting really hot under the collar, and Luann said, I'll go in and get it. I said, perhaps it's better you do. <laughs> How long does it take to make a cup of coffee? I would have been angry at, what, at the reception Jesus got. Like James and John responding to rejection from a Samaritan village, I think I would have wanted to call down fire from heaven. You know, just to teach them a little lesson, not to kill everybody, just sort of singe them a little bit. You know, you get the message. That's human nature. Our temptation is to get back, to get revenge, to take matters into our own hands, to fight fire with fire. Who do I think I am? Who do you think you are? I'll show you. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus responds in a rather curious way. He doesn't whimper and he doesn't get angry. He leaves. Good advice. My grandmother said, my, my grandfather I never met, but she said he never argued with her. And she was a banny rooster. She was five foot tall. If it came a time when there were going to be words between them, he would say, Ruthie, I'm going for a walk. And he'd go get his hat, put it on his head, and walk out the door. And by the time he came back, the storm had blown over. Leave. And Jesus leaves to continue his ministry in other villages where he will get a better reception. He continues teaching. He continues preaching. But some would consider Jesus' ministry in his hometown as a failure. Jesus merely decides upon a different method to accomplish the same end. It's the ministry that matters, not him. It's the message that's important, not the opinion people hold of him. People need hope. People need healing. And though personally disappointed, marveling at their unbelief, Jesus seeks a different way. He commissions the 12 and sends them out two by two in his authority. This is right after the passage, excuse me, <clears throat> passage that Julie read this morning. And he doesn't supply them with any money or food. They have to depend totally upon the generosity of those to whom they minister. 
And if rejected, they too should move on just shaking the dust from their sandals in testimony against those who will not receive the good news because it's the ministry that matters. It's the message that matters. It's the people who matter. And if they don't receive what the disciples have to give, it's their loss, not the disciples. Likely, the disciples returned to Nazareth, the very town that had rejected Jesus because it was close by. And if they would not receive Jesus, perhaps they would receive the same message from someone else that they didn't know. Someone with whom they had no history. The scriptures tell us that the disciples were successful and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Our first reaction to rejection and failure is usually anger. And our second normal reaction is to give up, give in, or quit. Jesus didn't either. Jesus planned a way around the obstacle, a different way of accomplishing his mission. Jesus trusted his ministry to God, and then he trusted it to his disciples, fishermen, tax collectors, and political insurrectionists. And what of the disciples? They had just seen their teacher and master rejected in his hometown. I would imagine they needed, or they, they reacted to his appointment to ministry in the same way most of us do. The same way I did when God called me to the ministry. Who, me? Do that? No way. I don't think so. I can't. I don't speak well. I don't know enough. I've never done this before. What if I fail? Henry Ford once said, failure is the on only the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. <laughs> Jesus had been rejected in Nazareth. He could do no mighty works and he marveled at their unbelief and then he took a different direction to accomplish God's purpose. He shared his ministry with others. He let God accomplish through the disciples what he was unable to accomplish in his hometown himself. Joyce Meyer, in her book, How to Succeed at Being Yourself, Finding the Confidence to Fulfill Your Destiny, writes these words. We don't need self-confidence. We need God-confidence. Jesus surrendered the success of his ministry to God and then surrendered it to his disciples. I refuse to believe that their naivete, inexperience, fear, and lack of confidence caught Jesus by surprise. I think that's why he sent them out two by two. After all, he could have sent them out individually or in groups of three or four, but he didn't. And I can almost imagine the conversation he had with each individual disciple in private conversation before he made the pairings. Okay, James, look, I know you're scared. I, don't, I know you don't see any gifts in yourself that I see. I know you lack confidence. And that's why I'm sending you with your brother, John. You can count on him, and together you can count on God. And then later, Jesus pulled John aside and said, John, I know you're scared. I know you don't see the gifts in yourself that I see. I know you lack confidence. That's why I'm sending you out with your brother James. You can count on him and together you can count on God. Rejection, fear of failure, and unwieldy tasks for unwilling disciples always threaten the mission of God in this world. And that's so important, I even wrote in my script, repeat. So hear it again. <laughs> Rejection... Fear of failure and unwieldy tasks for unwilling disciples always threatens the mission of God in this world. And still, some disciples hear the call and obey. And in the process, they discover the ability to do what previously thought impossible. They discover a God who is big enough for the task and faith and gifting equal to the assignment. And Mark concludes in 6, 12 through 13, so they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. 
The bumblebee is one of the most interesting insects in the insect kingdom. Look at the bumblebee's body. It looks like I used to look. It's wide and plump, not sleek and wasp-waisted as the hornet or the yellow jacket. Note its short wings. Now, back in 1930s, aerodynamicists at the University of Göttingen in Germany determined that by all the laws of physics and aerodynamics, the bumblebee should be totally incapable of flight. Unfortunately, the bumblebee had never had a course in physics or aerodynamics. The result is that the bumblebee doesn't know that it can't fly. And as a result, the bumblebee flies all over the place and makes holes in my deck. <laughs> Rejection, fear of failure, fear of what other people think, even fear of success can stymie and paralyze effective ministry. We fail to fly because we are certain that it is physically and aerodynamically impossible for us to do that. And we are then astounded when we see other bumblebees doing the very things we are certain are impossible for us. How does that happen? Those other bumblebees don't know they can't fly. They trust, they obey, and amazingly they soar. Obedience and trust in God will take us places we never dreamed possible or even likely. Why? Because God has bigger dreams for us than we have for ourselves. God sees things in us we cannot discover until they're tested. Will there be failures along the way? I can tell you absolutely. I know from experience. Will there be rejection along the way? Absolutely, I know, I can tell you from experience. And despite all this, God is faithful. Despite all this, God will work through us to do God's will in God's time. All we have to do is trust God and seek to be faithful. When you came this morning, you received a small piece of paper with a graphic of a bumblebee on it. I invite you to take it out now. Find a pencil or a pen to write with. If you don't have one, borrow it from a neighbor. If you still don't have one, just bite the end of your finger, sign it in blood. No, he didn't say that, did he? <laughs> I'm going to give you a few moments to ponder the following questions. Just think about this. Reflect on this. Let God speak to you this morning. What is God saying to me this morning? Is God telling me to travel more lightly? To trust myself less and to trust him more? Is God telling me to stop being a wet blanket <laughs> and start believing that with God all things are possible? Is God telling me to get going right now as a disciple of Jesus and trust less in my own strength and more in God? I want you to write your response on your paper. I'd like you to date it, just so you know it's 8821. And then place it in your wallet, your pocket, your purse, or your personal Bible. Make a great bookmark. The great preacher John Henry Jowett once told about a small village where an elderly woman died. She died penniless, uneducated, and unsophisticated. But during her selfless service over a lifetime, she made a tremendous impact for Christ in the village in which she lived. Many people would have considered her a failure in life. She wasn't. She was a bumblebee. She didn't know she couldn't serve Christ, so she did it faithfully every day 
day in, day out, showing his kindness, his love, and letting her light shine as a beacon of truth and righteousness. Everybody loved her. When she died, only her name, date of birth, and death and five words appeared on her gravestone, a tombstone that the townspeople purchased for her grave because she could not afford a gravestone herself. And it was her epitaph. Five words. She did what she couldn't. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Amen. God's sacrificial gift of his only begotten son be the inspiration for the sacrificial giving of our possessions and our lives. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures. Here.
You have rescued them and us from sin and its consequences. You have spoken to us the words that you would have us hear through your prophets, calling us back into relationship with you. And in the fullness of time, you sent forth your son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that you might remove the curse of sin and death. We give you thanks for your son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again for us and is ascended into heaven and sits at your right hand and continues to intercede for us. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. We give glory to you. And we seek to honor you with our lives. Lord, help us to get our eyes off of ourselves to Stop seeing what we cannot do and instead yield ourselves fully and completely to you so that we can see what you can do through lives fully yielded. Lord, you ask nothing of us that you will not empower us to accomplish. Keep our eyes open to the needs of our community, those around us, not just physical needs, but their spiritual needs as well. For in this season, there are many who are depressed, despondent, suicidal. There are many who have given up. There are many who have allowed their lives to be claimed by addictions. And in Jesus' name, we rebuke the enemy, the liar the one who comes to steal and to rob and to take from us the very life that you have given in Jesus Christ, that eternal life that begins now and continues into the world to come. Lord, we thank you for your presence here this morning. We pray that we would even now learn to be bumblebees. And Lord, we pray for Nancy and Michael as they travel to St. Louis, asking that you give them traveling mercies and an opportunity to be with Nancy's sister in her final hours. We pray for Mary Margaret Quivenin and her family. Grant them your peace. And Lord, hear us now as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing together our closing hymn.
remain in the sanctuary for a short meeting down here to receive a new member uh, right after the service. Um, I don't know why, but I've got a craving for tuna for lunch today. No, I don't. It's bumblebee. <laughs> no chicken of the sea today. It's got to be bumblebee tuna. Go out into the world in peace. Serve the risen Christ. Know that God loves you and that in this place you were loved. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and forevermore.